Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Aslam Abdullah, resident scholars at islamicity.org, hosting this 10 part series in the first 10 nights of Muharram with the intent to remember the oppressed communities of the world in the context of the martyrdom offered by. Imam Hussain, some 1400 years ago. Last night we talked about the definition of oppression. And tonight we have invited one of the well known author, writer, speaker, and social activist who is in the, on the East Coast, Dr. Mike Rose, who originally comes from India. But he has devoted bulk of his life in the United States, standing up for the people of several traditions, is standing up for the justice and for their human rights and for their human dignity. He has shown a keen interest in the oppressed communities in general and the Dalits and Adivasis of India in particular, and we'll talk about it in a minute. He's also one of the founding board members of Memna Science Foundation, which is dedicated to the upliftment of Native American nations. And he has had very quiet relationship with several American tribes, as well as Mayas in Mexico. And Dr. Agos is a social scientist. He's a public speaker. He's a thinker. He's an author. He's a newsmaker. And he is an interfaith uh, uh, officiant. Uh, as well as the weddings are concerned. He's deeply committed to pluralism in religion, politics, societies, human rights, and religious freedom. He's the founder and president of the Center for Pluralism, director of the World Muslim Congress, a think tank and a wedding official <laughs> in interfaith uh, marriages. Uh, his book, American Muslim Agenda is quite popular and one can find that book at Amazon and he intends to write two more books. One is uh, what we call a standing up for uh, others and the other one is Madame President. And um, he is committed to building cohesive societies and offers pluralistic solutions to issues of the day. His mission is to open people's heart and minds towards fellow humans. And so definitely when you would hear him and when you would read uh, the Ross Diary at rossdiary.com, you would know more about him. I've known Dr. Ross for several years and definitely his untired efforts to bring people together impresses me tremendously. Tonight, he would be talking about one of the oldest oppressed communities of the world that basically populate nearly one third of humanity. They are called the Dalits. They are called the Adivasis. They are called the untouchables. They are called the people who are living on the margin and who have been living in exploitation for several centuries. And Dr. Ross has devoted himself to the study of these marginalized people. And we are honored to have him today. And then after Dr. Ross's presentation, Dr. Balji would give a perspective from the, from in, in the context of the martyrdom of Imam Hussain and in the context of the struggle for justice that is associated with him and his, his family as well. Welcome to the Islamic City program, Dr. Mike Ross. The mic is yours. Please uh, proceed. Thank you, Dr. Aslam. I appreciate the big introduction. I appreciate that. And I appreciate Islamic City. And uh, Aleem and I were talking earlier. I have been a observer referential material from Islamic City for the last 15 or 20 years. And I recommend people to look it up, especially those who misunderstand Islam and Quran. And I appreciate this initiative by the Islamic City to speak up for the world's oppressed communities. Uh, during this month of Muharram, honoring Imam Hussain, it is one of the 
four sanction months this month of the year where peace is mandated and conflicts are to be mitigated. And there is a whole share, Islam zinda hota hai har karbala ke baad, simply meaning Islam revives after each struggle. The first being the one that happened in Karbala, led by Imam Hussein. I will skip some more on that because of the time. Let me start with the Dalit greeting as we start talking about it. Jai Bhim. And some of my Dalit friends are also watching. Jai Bhim to you. The greeting is drawn from Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar's name. And who was Dr. Ambedkar? He was known as the father of the Indian constitution. He was then the law minister who introduced the final draft of the India's constitution. He was an Indian jurist, economist, politician, and above all, he stood for justice for the oppressed communities. How did B.R. Ambedkar fight for equality? In 1927, Dr. Ambedkar had decided to launch active movements against untouchability. He began public movements and marches to open up public drinking resources, which I will share about in uh, my personal experience, and allowing the untouchable community to draw water from the main water tank of the town or the public wells. He also began a struggle for the right to enter Hindu temples. What this, in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to cover these uh, headings. Origins of Dalits, humiliation that they have endured, the oppression they have endured over the years. And there is a movement rising against that oppression. Then talk about a little bit about conversions, Dalits converting to different faiths, and talk about justice, the need for justice, and also talk about the Indian constitution, what it says about Dalits. And, uh, and sadly, shamefully, that discrimination has entered our soil in the United States, and we have to stop that. So these are the seven items I'll talk, and I'll give the conclusion statement. The Aryans, when they invaded the South Asia, the Central Asia, and they, they started the caste system. One guy by name Manu, when they walked in, they saw a lot of people in India, and they wanted to enslave them. They wanted people to do their dirty work of going to war, cleaning these things. And there is a movie, there is actual movie called Shudra to Khalsa, made by six, and it is encapsulates, it captures the exact way how Dalit things came about. It is an over-dramatized movie with a mixture of facts and fiction. The film's timing is terrible given the situation in India. It is a raw narrative about how the Aryans conquered India by the oldest technique known to mankind, divide and rule. They claimed themselves superior to the natives and created the Varna system, the caste system. Also, the Brahmins were on the top, whereas most of the native populations were considered subhuman, below them, inferior to them, in the lowest rung of the society were the Shudras. Brahman, Kshatriyas, and uh, Shudras. And they were also known as untouchables. The natives were told, I'm coming to your point, is a very sad point. The natives were told that the Varna system was created by God. And imagine uh, 1500 years ago, people did not have the ability to question, nor do have the ability to read. They believed whatever the person with knowledge like the Brahmins told them. They believe that this is God's word. Instill fear among them. The Shudras offered severe humiliation and deprivation of all human rights. The Brahmins declared that God created the untouchables to serve them. And the Shudras believed it was their duty to serve Brahmins as it's God's words. The film points out Manu Smith was created as well by a supremacist man. It is time for Hindus collectively to reject Manu Smriti. But unfortunately, that is what the current government in India wants to make the law of the land. 
and it is not going to be good for India in the long haul. How are Dalits different than other Indians? I'm sure many of our friends who are non-Indians, non-Pakistanis, and non-Bangladeshis were trying to see how, how can you distinguish between a Dalit and a Muslim and a Hindu? It's very difficult, but the caste systems are so rigid, one can easily identify them. There are 170 million Dalits in India. That is 16% of India's population. And the conversions, the government has banned conversions. And if Dalits want to convert to Buddhism, they have to get the permission. And Buddhism was once a dominant society in India. The upper caste Brahmins, again, it is politics, not religion, massacred the Buddhists and Jains around the fifth and sixth century and destroyed their stupas and temples respectively. And this is the point I wanted to come to. In the Al Jazeera video that I saw, this caught my attention, this sentence. One of the men says, we hate ourselves for what God has given me, given us. We hate ourselves for what God has given us. And we question how we came into being. This is sad. They were made to believe that they were inferior. They were to serve. And it is very difficult to undo that thinking that has been there for 1,500 years. Buddhism talks about self-respect. And there were mass conversions recently happened in Nagpur, 5,000 Dalits converted, and there have been villages converted because they feel they can feel some dignity, some respect, and non-discrimination if they are Buddhist. At one time, they used to convert to Islam and a massive levels. The Indian constitution, of course, abolished uh, the untouchability in 1950. However, it has not filtered down to the social practice. The law is there, but socially it is not practiced. Still very bad in India. I'll share some personal examples. The Dalits, were also called untouchables prior to India's independence. Then Mahatma Gandhi called them Harijans, that is God's people. Many in India call Harijans, I used to call Harijans. The word Dalit, you may be wondering where the word came from, comes from the Hindi word Dalan, meaning oppressed or broken. So that's the summary or the origins of Dalit, uh, and Dalit's oppression, they are reduced to be subhuman and they believe it. And that was a sad statement in the Al Jazeera video. Now talk about the humiliation that the Dalit community has gone through. Uh, I'll tell some personal stories. If you remember President Trump in the Puerto Rico situation when there was storm, he was throwing the toilet papers to people as if they were nothing, they had to catch it. And this is what happens in India, even today. The food, the leftover food is thrown at the lids. They had to grab and eat in a banana leaf or in their hands. That is very degrading, dehumanizing, very shameful. I don't know how people feel about it. Similarly, they were not allowed in their homes. And my dad <clears throat> took, my dad was a mayor at the time in the town. He broke all the traditions. He allowed the Dalit people to come in our home. My mom would cook food. They would eat in the same place that we would eat. Whereas the tradition at the time, they were not allowed inside the homes because the homes got dirty. They were not even allowed in the temples. So my dad put a big fight. As a kid, I used to go the first time, it was in 1961, these public taps were installed in my town, Elahanka. And it, every street corner there was a tap and people would come up with their vessels to catch the water. And on one side, we, there were Brahmins and all others for some reason, including Muslims were in the same line. And then there was another line for the Dalits. And this is very difficult. And the, the lines, the Brahmins and the Muslims and the other Hindus, 
have to finish the line for them to wait. They have to wait. They don't get their turn. But when they get their turn, they come and catch the water in the vessel and go. Before the next Dalit comes to catch the water, if the Brahmin goes back there again and washes the bloody tap, faucet several times as if it was dirty and filthy, you should see the look on the face of the Dalits. I fought. I fought against them. I couldn't fight against cleaning the faucet, but I fought against them, giving equal opportunity to line. One Brahmin, one Dalit. One Muslim, one Dalit. And that's how I fought. And uh, luckily, nobody beat me up for that. My dad was a big man, and uh, I had that advantage. In UP state, Uttar Pradesh state, a groom rode on a horse uh, for Bharat, his wedding Bharat. He, the Bharat is procession. He was beaten up to take, and was taken to hospital. The upper caste Hindus cannot tolerate that an inferior subhuman animal man can ride on the horse, which is above them. And that is very humiliating. A man, a groom cannot ride the horse, which is a tradition, common tradition. This is very humiliating for the Dalits. I, they have endured this for centuries. And the sad part is they believe God has ordained them to be that. And as a result, they're not fighting it back for their own rights. In a, I lived in a village called Irgampalli. I was going to be a farmer. My dad wanted me to be a farmer. I was connected with all the Dalits because in the farming, we all work together. The landlord, the biggest landlord in my town, Irgampalli, by name is Mr. Reddy, demanded the Dalit people to bring their wives and live with him overnight. You should see the faces of Dalits. They had no choices. They had dependent on that. This is the kind of humiliation that Dalits have endured. By God, nobody should endure that humiliation. Those Dalits who follow the Hindu tradition are not even allowed to go into the temple. It is sick and tired. My Dalit friend Nagaraj finally built a Hanuman temple in our town because of the sickness that he couldn't go to the temple. Dalits are considered subhumans. They're excluded from the society. They're not part of anything, part of it, weddings, part of uh, farming together. They're always kept away. They, some of the jobs they do is skinning the dead animals, removing the human feces, attacking Dalits for killing the sacred cow. They didn't kill, they're skinning the cow, but they were attacked and beaten up, taken to hospital. And there are cow vigilantes. I'm sure everybody knows about that. And there are 4.3 Dalits are raped every week. 4.3 Dalit women are raped every week and two Dalit men are killed every week. This is going on for centuries. They're, they're scared, they're apprehensive, they cannot breathe free air. And a pregnant recently, their pregnant woman was beaten because she refused to remove the caracas of a dead animal. She was pregnant, she was taken to hospital. Those guys kicked on her stomach with the baby inside the stomach. This is what the Dalits are enduring, the humiliation. 97% of the upper caste, if they do beat Dalits, they get away. Only 3% get prosecuted. Whereas it is the other way around. 97% of the Dalits get prosecuted or thrown in the jail. Uh, they fled the villages. The villages are being burned. Uh, hundreds of attacks every year. A Dalit who stood up for Dalit marriage, he was shut in a room and the house was burned. He was alive inside. Nobody could do anything. The state refuses to do the investigation because they're Dalits. They cannot get justice. Without justice, the societies don't function well. It is the loss of India that we treat Dalits that badly. Dr. Inca Ambedkar incorporated 
these rights for Dalit in the constitution, he rose to become the committee chair. Jignesh Mawani is one of the Dalit leaders who is fighting for the rights of land rights of the Dalits. They were given the land, but they can't get it. So this is very sad what the Dalits are enduring, the humiliation. And that is the humiliation part. Now, some good news for the Dalits. There is a movement, there is an uprising going on. Hindus, the lowest caste, have been trapped in a social system that forces them to be the lowest, dirtiest, menial jobs. Now in Gujarat, the home state of Indian Prime Minister, the biggest Dalit moment in over 50 years is forming, it's rising. Its aim is to go nationwide with an unprecedented call for 170 million Dalits across India to seek change and throw off the chains of religious and social repressions. With this unfettered access to this growing protest movement, million Dalits marched this to Ahmedabad in 2016, and they're planning again this year. For centuries, India's social structure was built around a rigid Hindu caste system. I don't want to call it Hindu caste system because it became a part of the culture. While the caste system was constitutionally abolished in 1950, its legacy is still there. It is lie of the land is there, but it is not practiced. Healing is very difficult. The discard and the division will continue as long as Modi is at the helm and has deep-seated hatred for others. It happens to be Muslims, Christians, and Dalits. You can see the depiction in the film how the upgraded Shudras were used. The upgraded Shudras were used to keep their flock at the bottom, their fellow Shudras, untouchables. This divide and rule has worked in the past and will continue to work, which we witnessed in the UP elections. Modi is not a Brahmin. He's brainwashed to be a higher grade Shudra to keep others enslaved people to his masters, which is RSS, Ambani, and Adhani. Let me talk a little bit about conversions. This is religious conversions. With Dalits continuing to face prejudice and discrimination with their own communities, some try to find social acceptance by converting to Buddhism, Christianity, Sikhism, and Islam. But that does not bring them relief. They are still discriminated, particularly among Muslim. Those Dalits who convert to Muslim Islam, although they are welcome, but they are kept at bay. The humiliation continues, even by Muslims. What a shame. Islam was supposed to teach equality. Why should anybody become a Muslim if they are not treated well? So they are moving towards Buddhism. These are huge restrictions placed on conversions, and that door to freedom is also being closed by Modi administration. Let me briefly talk about justice. Martin Luther King had said, Justice, injustice to one is injustice to all. Our justice for one is justice for all. Peace be upon Prophet Muhammad. He said, the, if you cannot stop injustice, the least you can do is speak up. Justice is the key for secure societies where every human feels secure in the society. I'll cut that short. Thanks to Ambedkar for legally removing caste-based discrimination. I'm certain it gave freedom to a majority of humans, but not all. Justice is one of the central values of any given society. Every action or reaction by a human being is designed to seek justice or balance, which gives a sense of security. Now, the Indian Constitution, the sixth item. Article 15 of the Indian Constitution forbids discrimination on grounds only of religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth. 
After independence, the constitution once again abolished untouchability. Dalit and scheduled caste, scheduled caste. The word Dalit comes from the Hindu word Dalan, which means oppressed or broken. Alternately or legally, as the government of India may now have them called Dalit is basically a caste defined in constitution under Article 341. The National Commission for Scheduled, Scheduled Caste has asked the state governments not to use the word Dalits in official documents, saying the term was unconstitutional. Again, they're trying to hide what is the fact. Freedom of conscience and freedom of profession was guaranteed in the constitution. Now I'll go to the, all this is happening in India. Some movements are happening, there is hope, but it is entering in the United States. And this is very dangerous as Americans, Indians, as Americans, Hindus, as American Dalits, we have to fight this. We cannot let America be stained, soiled by that discriminative attitudes. The case is of Cisco. In Cisco, the Dalit workers were not promoted only because they were Dalits. And the case is going on. And there's one Dalit tells us that the way the upper caste finds out you are a Dalit is you walk around, walk behind you in the interview process. They walk behind the Dalit and put their hand on the shoulder. And if they feel the genuine or the sacred thread, they know that man is Brahmin. If not, they decide he is Dalit and reject his application for whatever poor reason. This has got to stop. Google canceled talk on cash-based discrimination by Tenmozi Sondarajan. She runs an organization called Equality Labs, and they are committed to ending caste apartheid, apartheid. Once again, the man in Al Jazeera says, we hate ourselves for what God has given us. God has not given to them. That needs to be clarified. Now, let me conclude my presentation. There are, very, there are over 75 verses in the Quran that guides humanity to build just societies. And there are another hundred verses where God tells humanity, if you take care of my creation, that is your fellow human beings, your reward is with me. The Bible says, for I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And it goes on. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said in his last sermon, in March 8632, that an Arab has no superiority over non-Arab. Black is not superior to the white and vice versa. 1144 years later, after Prophet Muhammad made that statement in his last sermon, Thomas Jefferson included a similar statement in our immortal Declaration of India. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The above parameters are the basis for setting up our conscience. We are happy when we follow them and unhappy if we violate them. It behooves us to create cohesive societies where every human lives without fear of who he or she is. And that is when we attain peace. Peace of mind, free from guilt, free from tensions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Michaels. I am speechless after listening to what you have described through your personal anecdotes and through the historical realities. And uh, Dr. Balchi, I, I'm sure uh, what you heard uh, certainly would make uh, us restless that how come such a large 
segment of humanity has been in the suffering for the last several centuries. And the world has been quiet about it. Your reflections on that, what you heard. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaus, uh, for that very impassioned uh, elucidation of the state of the Dalits. It is truly like Dr. Aslam says, you know, we, we left speechless to say in this day and age, this is what we are facing uh, in, in India. Um, to make an observation in the presence of Dr. Gauss, who has personally witnessed, would really be like giving candle to the sun. So I'm not even going to attempt that. However, I'll take the opportunity uh, to just put a couple of uh, observations, questions, but one specific uh, incident I remember well, that uh, the 2001 Gujarat earthquake. And I happened to be part of the organizing committee at the World Federation, the Koja World Federation at that time. And six weeks, roughly, after the earthquake, we visited the areas of Boj, uh, Anjar, Bachao, and where the main earthquake areas were. And truly, I witnessed this firsthand as the treatment that was meted out and what we heard from the Dalits and some Muslim communities also in terms of the aid that was made available to them or the aid that was not made available to them, despite millions pouring into Gujarat at that time. And we did, you know, the small resources that we had as a private NGO, we did what we possibly could. But you could see the impact and you could feel the, the pain of those people. So I've seen that. Dr. Gaur firsthand uh, during the unfortunate um, earthquake that you know took so many lives in Gujarat. So yes. I can attest to that on a, on a, on a personal basis. Uh, having said that, um, and, and you know, after maybe Dr. Astor has made his observations, uh, you mentioned, of course, Ambedkar's uh, uh, quest to actually bring this to the world stage. And obviously, uh, Mahatma Gandhi called them Harijans. There was some tension between Mahatma Gandhi and Ambedkar, and maybe you might want to, with your knowledge, you know, shed some light on that. Number two, um, having read and looked at BJP and what's it doing to the Muslims and generally where India is, I actually noticed that there was a group of Dalits who actually are with the BJP in some of the provinces. And, and one wonders that, you know, with that, what is it that's attracting them and taking them towards the BJP. So there are some of the questions that arise. And lastly, let me say this, uh, just as a, uh, a quick observation. And I said this yesterday, that on the day of Ashur, Imam Hussein turns and says, is there a helper? Who is going to help me? Everybody had died. Who was he calling out to? Well, I say this, that Dr. Gauss, you are one of those who, who's answering Imam Hussein's call to say, is there a helper who is going to help me? Because that is what he was calling out to as part of the Karbala uh, tragedy that oppressed people everywhere are calling out to us. And that, you know, we are part of this and you have taken a leadership role. So we appreciate and salute you for what you have done. Dr. Walji, I appreciate your comment. Then I asked Dr. Abdullah, I also appreciate your comments. You mentioned about Dalits being in roles. Uh, that, that there has there's a Dalit uh, president of India last time, and now there is a tribal Adivasi. She is the president elect, president selected. As I mentioned earlier, the Brahmins want to upgrade some shudras or some untouchables so that they can keep the other ones oppressed. It is a show, it's a token presentation to tell the world, look, we have Dalit president. What can you say about it? But that is true, the Dalit is president. But every day, what's going on the street, the Dalits are being lynched. Four women are raped every week. Two Dalits are killed every week. It's not one time, it's going on forever. And that doesn't gel with uh, Dalits being in key positions. And they are the tokens. And they are the upgraded Shudras to keep other shudras way below in subhuman level. 
And that's what I can think of uh, to answer the question. How about Gandhi and Ambedkar's detention? Mahatma Gandhi believed in total nonviolence. He believed there is a goodness in each human being. And he thought he could appeal to the Brahmins to accept Dalits as equals. And he wanted this to be a process where voluntarily acceptance comes. Whereas Dr. Ambedkar did not believe in Gandhi. He believed there should be rules, there should be laws, and that should be encapsulated in the constitution. So there we had conflict on that issue for quite some time. But of course, uh, I'm glad uh, Gandhi yielded to Dr. Ambedkar for him to uh, incorporate these laws into the constitution. Dr. Koss, I have two questions. Hindu society is considered to be the oldest religious, one of the oldest religious communities of the world. How come that many upper castes had identified and empathized with the plight of uh, the Dalits and have tried to uplift them and have tried to basically treat them equally in their religious and social structures? And ha has there been any movement to abolish caste system in, 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 in India from religion? Because if you look at the names of those people who claim to be Hindus, they all carry a last name which identifies a particular caste. And you hardly would find any person who does not use a caste name to identify himself. So how come there has not been an empathy with the plight of Dalits while the conditions are well known to all of us? That's the first thing. And secondly, how come Muslims who have been in India for almost over a thousand years and who quote the Quran for justice, who quote Imam Hussain for the struggle and sacrifice and who basically make big claims that uh, their religion talks of equality and their religion talks of uh, egalitarian values have not come to the rescue of Dalits and have not made context and relationship with the Dalits as far as the social relationship and uh, what we call the political or religious relationships are concerned. The well, movie uh, that you talked about, you know, Al Jazeera, talks yes. about the Muslim Dalits and the presence of such Dalits even at this time when they are forced to bury their dead at different places other than the common Muslims is shocking. So is. where did we go wrong? Dr. Walji, you can also reflect on that and say that uh, where did we go wrong? I mean, it's certainly one can I, you know, justify the response of the Hindus because they believe in the scriptures, but the Muslims who believe in the egalitarian concepts, how come they let this happen for a thousand years while they were present in India uh, in a significant manner? Dr. Abdullah, I think uh, we all know the Muslim scholars are the villains of this situation. The scholars, not all, they're great scholars. There were some around the 11th, 10th, 12th century who were responding to the Crusades and labeling other people less than them. The Muslims, even some Muslims today, shamefully use the words Al Kufar La Etibar. I don't know if you have heard it. I have heard in the as a child growing up, meaning don't trust. And kufar means Hindus to them. It's not Hindus, but they label it as Hindus and use it as a derogatory term. One. And the Hindus are considered Napak. They are dirty people. This is a myth. We're going to bust these myths in a program we are coming up with busting myths between Hindus and Muslims. There are a lot of myths Muslims have propagated against Hindus, and that holds them from being open to others 
are treating them as equals. And that has continued it. And it is time we bust that nobody is, we should listen to what Prophet Muhammad said. If we honestly believe in Prophet Muhammad, he said, no Arab is superior to the other, no black is superior. If you believe in it, then we need to practice it as Muslims. If not, we shame on us if we can claim to be Muslims. The other value of Islam, one of the greatest values that Islam has inculcated is equality. You have to feel, think, act, your language. Everything has to treat equally. One of the greatest example is the Surah Kafirun. I will not go the whole Surah. There are six lines in Surah Kafirun. The first verse says, this is how God is telling us to treat fellow human beings. The first line says, is, I don't worship what you worship. The second line says, you don't worship what I worship. So there are six lines like that, six verses. Look at the beauty of this statement. God is telling us to talk to the other person, carry a dialogue where I don't treat the other person less than me. It doesn't say what you worship is inferior to me. What I worship is superior to me. God does not want us to do that. God wants us to say what you worship is not what I worship. What I worship is not what both of us are an equal pedestal. That is how you carry a true dialogue. When you carry a dialogue, give full dignity to the fellow human beings, we come to an understanding. This is where <clears throat> Dr. Abdullah Muslims beat lost somewhere in the conversation. We need to learn to treat everybody as a full person created by God and believe in Prophet Muhammad, believe in Allah's uh, guidance. And I think that would bring about a change. And Dalits are Muslims. Even among the, there is a nonsense called Ashraf and Ajal, something like that, which I'm not familiar with in South India, but it is there in North India. They don't marry among each other. What kind of Islam they are following? So that's one. Now coming back to your question about the reformers, how come the caste is not completely abolished? Raja Ram Mohan Rai and Bal Gangadhar Tilak, they made efforts to reform Hinduism. Sati was gone. There were several other things were gone. Caste system was so deeply embedded. It's more than embedded. It is a control mechanism for the Brahmins to control how the system works, how the government works, how the society functions. It is, they were more powerful in controlling. And even now, there are only three to 4% of Brahmins in India. Almost 90% of government positions are held by them. How can you bring a change when they are controlling it? So, Reforms have been attempted. There are many, many reformers among Hinduism, more than in Islam. In Islam, we are afraid to use the word reform. We don't have guts to speak out what is right. We just follow what was given, dished out to us. But among Hindus, they speak very clearly. And uh, I think reforms were there, but the control by the, the few, 3%, uh, is very difficult to undo it. And Dr. Ambedkar believed in rule of law. And again, I, we carried the rule of law to a small extent. But with the Maudi government, that is all shattered. I don't see much hope for India until 2024 when there is a new election. A new prime minister is elected where they restore dharma back again. That is righteous. There is a hope. Dr. Abdullah, Lord Krishna had said this beautifully. Whenever extremity reaches to the peak, I will come among you. It doesn't mean Lord Krishna. It means through somebody, there is a peacemaker, like Gandhi was a peacemaker. Others were peacemaker. He will come through us and restore righteousness. There is a hope. We are reaching the peak point of extremism in India. And when it reaches that peak, I think 
God sends a messenger or a peacemaker. And Krishna in Hinduism also has said that. I'm hoping they were right. Dr. Valji, your take on that. And probably if you could also reflect on how the, the, those who uh, recognize the martyrdom of Imam Hussain should respond to uh, these kind of situations. Absolutely. Imam Hussain had the opportunity to live a luxurious life by endorsing Yazid, the bad man, to become the Khalifa. He had an opportunity, but he believed in being righteous. As he followed Prophet Muhammad's saying, if you can't stop injustice, say it. He fought against that injustice. And today, Muslims in India, Dalits in India, and uh, Sikhs in India are putting up with what is happening to them. Imam Hussain gives the motivation, inspiration to stand up. We shouldn't worry about my loss. I'm going to lose this. But in the long run, everybody loses. If you follow the Imam Hussain's track, stand up, speak up. I think the world would be a better place. I'm sorry. Uh, you are going to say that, Dr. Walji. Yes, I, I totally echo the sentiments that you've just given, that people need to stand up. To go back to Dr. Aslam's original question, where did we go wrong as Muslims? What happened? Well, uh, Dr. Kaus, you referred to the Manusmuthi earlier on in how these things actually crept into the scriptures or the so-called scriptures, where uh, these things were then embedded from generation to generation and continues. I believe that there came a time uh, when, in, in this short time, all I can say is give an example, that there came, came a time where the movements of the type that Imam Hussein uh, motivated us somehow became fossilized. We actually became prisoners of our own rituals and forgot the essence. You know, Mulana Rum says this beautifully. He said uh, about the Muslim community at one point in time that you have a bottle of perfume and all you're doing is looking at the form and the shape of that bottle, never opening the bottle to feel the essence. And I believe that these rituals were the ones where we got. Kokuna is within those rituals and that free thinking. Imam Hussein said at that time to the army of Yazid, that if you do not believe any, in any religion, there is famous words, at least think like free men. This is what he said. And yes. I believe that we as Muslims and the Dalits themselves, the others, you know, communities in India, I think the idea of thinking as free men seems to have gone and we each are looking for our own personal interest to say, what will I lose if I stand up? Imam Hussein was willing to sacrifice his six-month-old baby for that, we, yes. you know, as today's communities, are not willing to stand up to this. And unless, like you said, a Krishna comes, a Savior comes, a Mahdi comes, that one is able to do this. In the meanwhile, I believe that as people who feel on social justice, and we wouldn't be here talking in the middle of the night about this if we did not, uh, that if, you know, we are able to at least pass this message on to the, to, to the rest and say this is something that needs to be done. Nothing will, nothing will happen. This is falls on the few to raise those voices and at least on the day of judgment, we can say to our maker that, yeah, Allah, we tried. We did what we possibly could. And this is, is, is our fate, unfortunately. I don't want to be a prophet of doom, but you know, a question to you, uh, of course, is, you know, you mentioned the Gujarat uh, uh, movement, which is picking up some more steam now. There have been, as we know in history, many different movements for the Dalits, and they came and went. What, are, what do you think? What's your prognosis in terms of where this movement might lead to? Now that with social media, with the world becoming much smaller, the human rights abuses can be promoted, you know, to the rest of the world to bear pressure on, on India to do something like this. 
Thank you very much. And I think this is the taking point uh, that no matter where we are and no matter what school of thought we belong to, we must all coalesce our efforts for the struggle for justice for all regardless of their faith and regardless of their ethnicity and their culture. And I think this is the message that uh, our great leader Imam Hussain wanted to leave us with that never underestimate your own dignity and your own capability in fighting injustice wherever you are. Even if you are one, you can make a difference by setting an example of sacrifice and by accepting the martyrdom if that be the fate. And I think that is what Dr. Walji was alluding and you were also alluding that unless we are willing to sacrifice our own comfort for the sake of those people who have been denied justice, things are not going to change. The oppressed communities, no matter who they are, where they are, the least they want is an acknowledgement. And the Dalit community today, I hope feel that Muslims are standing up for them. That acknowledgement gives them some relief. It may not change their plight, but gives them some relief. And I appreciate Islamic City, Dr. Walji, Dr. Abdullah, and everybody here for doing this program. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for coming to the show and then sharing your valuable information. And then tomorrow, uh, we would have one of the leading professors of the American Native Studies in the United States, who also happens to be the spouse of Dr. Goss, uh, to talk about the plight of uh, Native Americans. Uh, and we would definitely learn from uh, the direct sources what happened in this country and how come the present generation is totally unaware of what many of its predecessors did to those people who were the original inhabitants of this one. So please do let other people know about it so that we can all uh, basically have a fresh perspective on that. So with that, I think we should conclude. It is almost uh, 9.10 and uh, who else other than Dr. Walji be there to give us the concluding remarks and the dua and with that inshallah we will conclude tonight's session. Dr. Walji, please. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Thank you Dr. Stone. Uh, thank you Dr. Kaus uh, for standing up for the rights of the oppressed and I appreciate being part of this movement where we remember Muharram and we remember Imam Hussein, it's something that is practiced and rightly so, that the least we can do is be a sense of solace for our Dalit brothers and sisters, you know, within their plight. And just as it is that, you know, we, there are two terms and in this part of the dua, that Ya Allah, do not just make us witness these events, but make us to actually be witnesses and to make sure that we are actually part and parcel of being a witness, not just witness. The witness, that witnessing that we would do would be that we would be part of that and not just pass on. And this is what we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to stand up, to remember Muharram, to remember Imam Hussain, and at the same time, Give us the topic to try in our own small way, implement, convey the message. And we, with, the, with those words, we say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana la tuzik kulubana ba'da iz hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma. Inna ka anta al-wahhab. Bi rahmatika ya rahman.